Hey friends, how you doing tonight? Well, I'm on my third cup of coffee and I'm, I'm antsy to get started here. So if you've come to share some stories tonight, then come on over and find a spot around the fire. Sit down and relax with a cup of something that brings you pleasure. By the time the fire burns down and we have all had the chance to share some stories, we should know each other a little better. Well, that's what these campfires are all about. Bonding. Even if it's just that you get to know yourself a little better. Now, how can that not be a good thing? Well, let me start. I've got an update story to tell you. Do you remember Liz, the forest ranger? How I told you about her having that secret admirer? Well, after her game camera showed that a young male squatch had left gifts on her car and was apparently enamored with her, well, if you do, then you'll remember that she requested and was given a reassignment to the other end of the park. She didn't show her bosses any of the 119 pictures she had of the hairy face kissing her Subaru because she didn't want trouble. She was a natured lover and there wasn't any real damage, so she figured that a, a new start in a new area of the park 20 miles downstream would be the best move. And it worked for her. It had been about six months since she started as a, a supervisor of sorts. She had a park service pickup and she was to drive to all the remote facilities in this region and, and write inspection reports. Sort of look for trails that needed repair or broken picnic tables, watch for any conflicts that tourists might occur. She was good in this position and, and she really took her job seriously. She often found herself parking the truck and walking two or three miles just to inspect a, a remote tourist feature somewhere. And so it was that she found herself a mile up the trail from the trailhead and almost to the river overlook where the trail came out of the trees and brush to, to look over a beautiful river canyon. Almost a hundred yards down a brushy hillside was the river and it was a foamy boiling river with deep dark pools and occasional waterfalls. So Liz stood out at the overlook and took in the sweeping views. It's beautiful. Made it all worthwhile. But she wasn't the only one there that day. Nope. Three lives were about to cross paths and it would be life changing for all three. Six months back, after the Sasquatch couldn't find the Subaru, where it had been parked every day for years and he didn't smell the patchouli oil that was the aura that surrounded the most intriguing creature he had ever seen. He became a little despondent and sort of wandered aimlessly, just hiding and surviving. So it was that he found himself at a, a low bank section of the river below a pretty good sized waterfall at the edge of a large dark pool and the head of a long set of rapids. Though he was always on alert, Bigfoot have to be, you know, because of the sounds from the moving water, he just wasn't aware that he was being stalked. A large, dangerous, 35-year-old dominant male squatch with burning red eyes was slowly creeping up on him from directly behind with murder on his mind. Just 20 feet away and the squatting young male half turned in just in time to see the large form rushing him with a pine limb held as a club and instinctively turning away and taking the club on the shoulder kind of as a glancing blow saved the young male's life. The force of the murderous rush from the large male carried them both into the river. But when he hit the water, he instinctively dove down into the dark pool. If it weren't such a dark moonless night, he may have been found and murdered by the dominant male. The Sasquatch was trying to kill his competition for any breeding females. Well, this is the way of nature, and it has been for all of time. Probably always will be. Well, the young Bigfoot worked his way downriver, staying as close to the bottom as he could. He knew the danger if he was found, especially with a wounded shoulder from that club. Well, holding his breath, he made it through the rapids and surfaced under an overhanging bank covered by willows. Out of sight, he recovered his breath and he tried to locate his attacker using his sharp senses. 
Well, he stayed in his hideout for a good half hour, not not wanting to be found there in the daylight. He knew he would have to take the risk of getting caught and move away from where he was. He figured the most concealment could be found in the river, and going upriver was impossible because of the rapids and the waterfall, so downriver was the best chance of survival. So, taking a big breath, he submerged and kicked away from the bank. He surfaced near rocks and logs and would get another breath and resubmerge and move on down the river in that way. He traveled this, this way for about an hour and a half until he got to the top of a waterfall and he was forced to get out of the river and portage the falls. He rested there on the bank and he fell into a deep sleep. He, he woke at dawn and got up and moved into some thick brush to sleep most of the day away. His injury hurt, and sleeping seemed to be the best thing he could do. So he packed some mud on the, on the shoulder, and that usually helps, and went and laid down. Well, moving at night and resting often, he continued downriver for several days. Then, leaving the river canyon, he climbed to a rocky knob to rest there. There weren't any tourists up there. He went in to rest for the day. Now... That gets two of them in the same location, and now for the third. Ah, uh, Odin Doddle, what a waste of a life. He cared for nothing, he loved nothing, and he did nothing constructive. In fact, the opposite applied. He hated everything, and he destroyed everything that crossed his path. He was a murderer, a rapist, and represented everything that was evil on this planet. He had been released early from his latest stint in federal prison. Apparently, he displayed good behavior while incarcerated. Huh. Shuffled to a halfway house where he stayed several weeks until he could cut his ankle monitor off and, and leave town in a hurry. It was six hours before he was missed, but by that time he was long gone, 300 miles away. Catching a ride at the truck stop, he rode till the trucker stopped for the day. He began walking then. It wasn't unusual to see walkers and hikers this close to the mountains. He attracted very little attention as he climbed the, the winding country road. Staying in the shadows when he heard a car approaching, he was able to get to the trailhead for the canyon outlook in just four days total. And that is how we now have the three participants in this fateful event about to cross paths. Waking up in the late afternoon, fully rested from sleeping all day uh, on that rocky knob, he began to stretch his shoulders and was much better and had healed nicely since his attack four days back. He watched the small birds flitting about and, and then there it was. A familiar smell. From the back of his mind came all the emotions associated with it. There was hope and there was happiness and there was loss and despair. Curious, he moved to the edge of the rocky knob, and there below him, on the trail, was Liz. She had left her truck in the lot and walked a mile up to the overlook when the Bigfoot smelled her familiar scent. Natural soaps and patchouli oil are very distinctive in the wild. At the same time that he saw Liz, he saw another human behind her and, and closing fast. From his vantage point, above and slightly behind, he had a good view of the two hikers. This wasn't new for Ogan. Though skinny, he was wiry strong, and he could easily overpower the ranger. The element of surprise was important in the taking of his victims. What would he do to this one? He didn't know. He sort of became a different person when this happened. One thing for sure is his victims always suffered. They always felt his hatred for life, and they always died, begging to live. His pace quickened as he closed the gap on the ranger. He reached out and he grabbed her around the waist from behind, pinning her arms at her side in the embrace. Liz was taken by surprise, so taken by the panorama before her that she didn't hear the maniac's last rush. She struggled, but she was at a huge disadvantage. She was following the same path as Odin Doddle's victims. Time was critical now. In a few minutes, she'd be lost. But what she had that the others didn't 
was a very mad, very large, and hugely physical Bigfoot to intervene. Sensing trouble in the way the man had approached the ranger, and now with Liz struggling, the young Squatch became the beast that he always was. He jumped down the hill to the trail in two giant leaps, then moving with the speed that only a crazy mad giant has, he hit that maniac and prying him from his victim continued off the trail and down the brushy slope towards the river. Moving at a run while holding the criminal around the waist and dragging him through the brush, making ungodly scary sounds as they went. It had all happened so fast for Liz that she wasn't really sure what, what had happened. First a person grabbed her from behind for no reason, then held her and wouldn't let her go. Well, what she remembered most about him was his strong grip and his terrible breath. It smelled like death. And she wasn't wrong, but it wasn't her death this time. Odin hit the water backwards, still in the grasp of the giant. He got to look into the face of the one that would take his life. And all of his victims would have been really happy to know he was scared. He screamed all the way down the hill. The beast took him to the bottom of the dark pool and broke quite a few bones in that evil bastard's body. He was just a limp bag of flesh when that Bigfoot surfaced with the lifeless Ogun. Dragging then carrying the body, the still enraged Sasquatch set off for a place to bury the body so that it would never be found. Uh, you know, Bigfoot seemed to have that knowledge naturally. Well, it took a few minutes for Liz to catch her breath. Quite an adrenaline rush she had. She watched as the beast ran off with her attacker and took him underwater. All so surreal. She had never seen an animal move that fast. And what of it, twice in one year that she had an encounter with a Sasquatch? That's crazy. Most people have, well, zero encounters in their lifetime. And why hadn't it injured her? I mean, it seemed like it wasn't even interested in her. Very strange and scary. Not just a cryptid encounter, but it had killed a man. What should I do, she wondered. What, what do I report? She gathered herself up and walked back to her truck. She was in a much better shape when she walked the mile back to the trailhead. Along the way, she'd made the decision to not make the report today. First of all, it was a fantastic story, and, and who would believe it? There was no body, and there was no blood. And on top of that, the beast had, had saved her from the crazy guy. So if she reported him, they would come and they would hunt him, and something about that didn't set well with Liz. There were no other vehicles in the parking lot as Liz drove her park service truck out onto the road and headed home. Huh. So, do you think Liz understood yet? <laughs> that this might be the same critter that had slobbered on her Subaru. She does seem a little slow on the uptake, huh? Maybe with a little time it'll come to her. That's sort of the way life is, friends. Some things that are a little obvious to some of us may not make any sense to others. And that's why it's important here to, to be a little tolerant, especially with so many crazy things going on in the world right now. Well. I've had enough tonight, folks, so I'm going to leave you here at the fire. As always, I enjoyed your company, and I look forward to our next campfire. Till then, well, this is Clay Steele, and be good to yourselves.